Evil comes in many forms in Five Nights at Freddy's. From an outside perspective, the animatronics seem to be evil. Multiple times we see the murderer of the missing children, who is very clearly an evil man. We constantly hear about Fazbear Entertainment, an evil company that's selling corrupted products and are holding an indie game developer hostage. But under all of that, there's actually a deeper evil that I feel the FNAF theorist community don't exactly talk about too often. So while today's video is going to contain speculation, I'd also like to talk about how a lot of the series has been positively affected by the evil hidden in the shadows. And as always, let me know if you enjoy this video by subscribing. I will be readdressing some points I made in a prior video, so you don't need to watch it, but it's a good one if you are intrigued. And actually, let's begin by discussing Nightmare On. I feel like there's a huge misconception going on with Nightmare On, and that is that it's not canon. There's two points I'd like to make to help you to understand why I think Nightmare On is in fact important. First of all, it definitely is canon in the series, past FNAF 4. Scott explicitly stated that in the FNAF 4 Halloween DLC, some characters are canon and others, like Nightmare On, aren't. However, in Ultimate Custom Night, it reappeared, and then again in Help Wanted, and then again in Security Breach. I don't think that Scott's statement from seven years ago still applies, because as we've seen ourselves, things change. And my second point is that even though Nightmare On isn't canon in FNAF 4, it still provides us useful information. Maybe the protagonist had never seen the puppet before. It helps with the character development, timeline placement, and world building, because we're able to ask why. It's similar to the fake ending of Sister Location, or the many endings of Security Breach. They may not be canon to the continuity of the games, but they still show what could have happened, which gives us valuable information. So here's my question. Why isn't Nightmare On canon to FNAF 4? As you may be aware, Nightmare On is a stand-in for Nightmare in the Halloween DLC. It's essentially a reskin. But over time, the line separating the two has started to blur. Nightmare On has been appearing way more than Nightmare, and you'll notice that the Nightmare On plush in Security Breach is actually named Nightmare Plush. And that's a strange little detail that connects to some comments I got on my video. I said that Nightmare On is essentially the Grim Reaper of the series. The puppet gives life and the Nightmare On takes it. It's a representation of death. But people informed me that they believed Nightmare fit that role better. This is funny because I think they're one in the same. If you compare their jump scares, which have the same sound effect, you see that they are in the exact same position. Even their mouths line up perfectly. And this is not a coincidence. You could say it's just a reskin, but Scott had the opportunity to make Nightmare on vastly different to make it even scarier. He didn't. It's literally one frame. He could have changed it in any way, but he, he just didn't. They both represent death, but death comes in many forms. Nightmare on is not canon in FNAF 4, because why would the puppet have anything to do with the story? A Fredbear form, on the other hand, capitalises on the crying child's fear, or is at least more connected to the crying child, which is why the canon form of death in FNAF 4 is Nightmare. Another thing I got a lot of comments on is the fact that the icon for Ultimate Custom Night has Nightmare on's face. Why Nightmare on specifically when Golden Freddy is the one you should not have killed? Well, it's because it's a game about facing death. Except this time, you're William Afton. So a puppet form is more effective as it represents Charlotte, Afton's first victim in the series. That was probably a lot to take in, but what I'm essentially saying is that Nightmare and Nightmare On are both the same entity, representing death. When it comes to FNAF VR, things start to make a little more sense. We know that the real history of Freddy's is being mocked in video game form by Fazbear Entertainment with the aim to cover up past events. The way they did this was by hiring a rogue indie developer, and this is in fact Steve Snodgrass from the story Help Wanted in Haps. They catfish him, trap him indoors, and petrify him while he is tasked to make four video games about Freddy's. The illusion discs and other devices used give him night terrors, and he is killed off before the fourth game is even finished. This is why many believe this is the origin of FNAF VR's FNAF 1, FNAF 2, FNAF 3, and Night Terrors game modes. And wouldn't you know it, 
Night 2 of Night Terrors is a face-off against Night Marion. There's something more interesting to note here, however. In the real-life events that we see in the original games, we follow Michael, but there's a lot of things that happen to him that Fazbear Entertainment knows nothing about. For example, in FNAF 1, there's the Golden Freddy animatronic, but in FNAF VR, there isn't, because Golden Freddy was personalised to Michael. Golden Freddy in FNAF 1 is probably his brother saying, it's me, but Fazbear Entertainment would never have known about that, it's just a hallucination. So when you compare the original FNAF games to FNAF VR, you're really able to piece together what is real and what is a hallucination in Michael's head or under the wraps from even Fazbear Entertainment. What else is missing in the VR remake? The Shadow Animatronics. These guys are really strange because Shadow Freddy is literally just the shadow of Golden Freddy. They use the same models but different colours. These two seem to be extremely connected to the original Springlock animatronics, whichever way you look at it. And there's a lot of theories on what exactly they are, whether they are the souls from the multiple simultaneous Springlock failures or just shadowy hallucinations in the mind of Michael. Special Delivery may have given us a better idea, however. In the game you are able to collect Remnant. Now, in reality, Remnant is more like a haunted molten metal rather than souls, but let's ignore that for a second. The Ultimate Guide seems to have a bit to say about the types of Remnant in the game. There are two kinds of Remnant, bright and shadowy, and when they spawn, the room is filled with ethereal whispering. If Remnant is a conductor of emotion, it's possible that bright Remnant forms from positive emotions, while shadowy Remnant is formed from negative ones. When you collect too much of this so-called shadowy remnant, you actually spawn Shadow Bonnie, implying they are very much connected. I'd even go as far as saying that Shadow Bonnie is made of this shadowy remnant. This shadowy remnant, however, clearly isn't actual remnant, but it seems to have similar properties. So what else could it be, and why is it all around us? If you've read through the Fazbear Frights books, you probably have a good idea on what this is. We were introduced to Agony in the third epilogue by Dr. Phineas Taggart. You see, I'm convinced that Agony has a greater energetic radius and power than any other emotion. I have done numerous experiments to measure, contain, capture, and study the leftover emotion embedded into objects that were near a tragedy. My work is focused on my hypothesis that you can take a saturation of Agony, add any kind of intelligence, even an artificial one, and they will combine together to transmute the energy of emotion into the energy of physical action. This, I believe, is what explains what people call haunted objects. To explain in basic terminology, agony is an emotion that is released during a tragedy, and it is able to attach to objects. This strong energy is able to turn into kinetic energy that animates objects. Things in the series, such as the Paper Pals, don't need children's souls to move. They are able to move simply because of past tragedies haunting the walls of the pizzerias. So somehow, I'd say there's a sort of Venn diagram of connections between the concepts of remnant agony and memories in the series. Within the Fazbear Frights, there are a ton of stories you are able to explain through agony, and one of them happens to be about a kid who can't beat his brother at arcade games, to the point where his rage and his agony clings onto his back as a shadow rabbit. Another side effect of Agony is shown in the first epilogue, where the urban legend of the Stitch Race kills multiple people, making their eyes bleed black down the sides of their faces. Now where have we seen that before? I really like how all of this seems to be piecing together, but I do have one more topic to go onto that you're going to like a lot, and that is of course, the big villain of the Fazbear Frights. Eleanor herself. The reveal at the end of the Stitch Race Stingers is that she is made purely from negative emotions, but if that wasn't enough proof for you, she ends up dying while black tendrils shoot out of her body. I believe that Eleanor is, in fact, a real functioning Funtime animatronic. We see that she's made of metal and that she has working buttons. The actual evil behind the Eleanor animatronic is actually the shadowy entity made purely from agony, and probably made stronger with Remnant. I also believe that this form of evil came straight from William Afton himself. In The Man in Room 1280, we see his transition from his physical form into his digital form, which occurs when he romits up a strange black tar-like substance. And that is it. 
That's this shadow entity that we've been talking about this whole time. It can hook itself onto other bodies, it can morph into different shapes to capitalize on your fears, and it's most importantly, the shadow of the series. Spoilers for Submechanophobia, this is actually the exact thing that we see happen in Animatronic Apocalypse. The club members are all essentially in this cult, until Robbie stabs Mr. Renner with a fire poker, causing black liquid to pour out of his body. This, of course, is evil attaching itself to a physical body again. And it's super funny to me that all of this, in the books, ties back to Nightmare On. Eyes that bleed black down the sides of the face, black tendrils emerging out of a dying body, a whole freaking cult like how I describe the staff bots in Security Breach. Seriously, it's all connected. So if you want to know how FNAF portrays evil, it's through the shadows. Manifestations of agony are the reason a lot of what happens in FNAF happens. And don't forget that agony is produced from intense negative emotions. There's a lot more of these powerful emotions floating around than positive ones. Which is why there are so many stories in this franchise about people being haunted by just being in the vicinity of Freddy's. It's uncontrollable and it's such a satisfying answer, to me at least. Let me know if you think so too in the comments below. This is very much a more speculative video than usual, so I apologise if you weren't too into it, but I do have a whole variety of content coming up in 2023 that you'll want to be subscribed for. So thank you for watching, stay tuned, and I'll see you next time.